I'm Francis Durnley, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, in a special episode, we hear a constellation of voices from a special concert hosted at the Ukrainian Catholic Cathedral in Mayfair, London, in support of the Ukrainian Welcome Centre, who have been at the forefront helping Ukrainians in Britain displaced by the war. For this edition, amid gilded mosaics, red brick tiles and creaking pews, I'll speak to the head soprano for her reflections on what the war means for her country. To the Bishop of the Cathedral about how the community have responded to the plight of Ukrainians and to the head of the Ukrainian Welcome Centre about the nature of their work supporting refugees. It's an in-depth look at the day-to-day work of those who have been supporting people forced to leave their homes and settle in a foreign country. But first, I talked to the soprano at the concert, Yulia Trishku, about her story and the plight of her country. Please note, these interviews were recorded several weeks ago now, especially for these Christmas broadcasts. Hello, my name is Yulia Trishku, or Shkvarko, which is my maiden name, and I'm an opera singer based in Manchester. My family is Ukrainian, and they're from Lviv. And then when I was 20, I got a scholarship at the Royal Northern College of Music, so I went here by myself. And then um, I met my husband here, who is actually from the same city as my family is from as well. And we stayed in Manchester. When the war began, did it come as an immense shock to you? It was a massive shock, to be honest. Uh, I heard people saying that it would start and I was, honestly, I was very sceptical. I very much believed in the sense of uh, people, you know, I was hoping that uh, it would never start. Uh, so when people were mentioning, I was saying, no, no, I'm sure not in this century. It's uh, Europe, you know, they would never do it. Um, and then when I, I remember this day when I woke up and um, I received uh, lots of messages um, from my family saying, we're fine. And I, I just thought, um, what, what's wrong? Because um, we have two, two hours difference, yeah. Um, and uh, I checked the news and I realized that Ukraine is being bombed everywhere. I think what uh, Russian government underestimated is how uh, patriotic Ukrainians are and uh, that they will be fighting, that they will be fighting until they do win. At the same time, it's very sad because lots of lives are lost because of uh, crazy power-hungry people, you know. So, yeah, it, it affected us significantly. It was a massive shock. I didn't know how to gather myself. I didn't know whether to go to back to Ukraine and be there or it would be a silly idea because I have a, a child here and uh, my husband as well. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, an event that uh, broke everybody emotionally, mentally, and it still does. You sort of learn to live with it, I think. Uh, and uh, like my family in Ukraine says, uh, a person can get used to anything, even to sirens, you know. You're a singer and it's been fascinating speaking to Ukrainians about the role that Ukrainian culture has played in keeping morale high. What does Ukrainian music mean to you at a time like this? I think it's something that um, helped me gather myself and helps me to find strength at this difficult time, you know, and something that I can express my emotions into. Because if I'm honest, there are days when I feel extreme anger, when I just want to, uh, I don't know, shout, why is this happening? Why is this still going why can't anything be done you know Um, and I say this to my family and they say yes it's horrible it's incredibly frustrating but uh, by anger we just uh, you know grow anger so you have to find the way to gather yourself and express these emotions in a positive change what is your vision of the future of Ukraine at the end of the war what does that country look like to you You know, my dream is for the country to be completely liberated. And as I was discussing this with my husband, you know, I think I 100% I'm sure that they will win because, you know, it's such a strong spirited nation and God is with them, you know. And I think um, that's what uh, the time is showing, that these people are so united and have so much faith and so much true faith that uh, 
no matter what the outcome is, Ukraine already won. You know, they already won and they will win for sure. And no matter how much destruction Russian government has brought into this land, because they strategically ruin everything, all the industrial networks, everything that could, you know, help the country develop and grow. So they do it specifically to ruin the country so it wouldn't be able to exist, you know. Despite all of this, I think once the war is over, they will be like Phoenix reborn, you know, with new strength. Fantastic. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. much. The Russian Orthodox Church has come under considerable scrutiny since the invasion, with its archbishop inciting violence towards the Ukrainian people. We've covered this in detail, but less so the role of the Ukrainian church in this war. To discuss this, and what it's like to be the Bishop of the Ukrainian Cathedral in London, I next spoke to Kenneth Nowakowski about his life and experiences in recent months. Well, thank you very much. I think concerts like this continue to bring awareness to the British people that the war has not ended. Sometimes it becomes news that we hear all the time. How many times can television and radio and newspapers talk about how many people were dead today and we come almost numb to it and I think for me one of the big things is to let the British public know that the war is still on don't forget about Ukraine stand with Ukraine and I think these concerts and these types of events are important but also our way of thanking the people of the United Kingdom for opening up their hearts their homes to the thousands and thousands of people that have had to flee harm's way. Many of these people are young women who are mothers with children whose husbands have stayed behind to defend Ukraine. And so the welcome, Ukrainian Welcome Center that we've established along with the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain is here to help those people you know, with all sorts of things uh, to make them feel welcome. Sometimes it's really just a case of coffee, tea and biscuits and allowing them to speak in their own language, to know that they're not alone. And other times it's more serious how to register for the NHS, how to uh, register their children in schools, how to prepare a resume. And I think in general, this welcome center is a real wonderful symbol of how in general the the Ukrainian people have been welcomed. This is the 75th year of uh, the original settlement of Ukrainians in Great Britain. They came as displaced people after the Second World War and they formed the basis of this Ukrainian community here. And then of course with the collapse of the Soviet Union, many more thousands of people came here to work and to make their homes here. But with the arrival of over 150,000 Ukrainian dis temporarily displaced people, it's, it's, I think, a challenge, but we aren't alone. Recently, I returned from Ukraine. I was in Western Ukraine and also in the capital cave, but also I visited the communities of Irpin and Bucha. I tried to prepare myself for the buildings that I would see that are damaged, the homes that were destroyed, I don't think you can prepare yourself for something like that. And we have a parish in Irpin that I celebrated Divine Liturgy in. And then afterwards, I was able to spend a few hours talking with the people, hearing their stories. And one of the people came up to me and said, Oh, Bishop Kenneth, it's so wonderful to see you again. And I said, uh, wonderful, but I've never been here before to Irpin. And she says, oh no, shortly after the invasion, I found myself in London and I was attending regularly at your cathedral. But I came back two and a half weeks ago because this is my home. As wonderful as England was, hospitality was great. This is my home and I wanted to be at home. And I think that we're seeing that for most of the people that we meet here they want to go home, but when they're here, they also don't want to just be on government assistance, which they're very grateful for. They want to be able to work, to contribute to society. 
And after I listened for uh, some time to the different stories that people were telling me, I s said to them, perhaps you have something that you'd like to ask me. And the question was somewhat surprising for me, but it also gave me a lot of hope. The question was, what's King Charles like? And for me, what did that mean? That they haven't divorced themselves from the society. Of course, you know, we had just gone through the 10 days of official mourning for Her Late Majesty, the Queen Elizabeth, and her state funeral. So people knew about that, but they also knew about the king. And they remembered that King Charles and the Queen Consort Camilla came and visited us here at this cathedral just five days after the invasion to offer their support. And so we're very grateful to their highnesses, their royal highnesses, for that support, but through them very much the, the British people. The Ukrainian Welcome Centre, a large communal space of tables, chairs, books and cuddly toys for children, is located underneath the cathedral. It provides support for those displaced by war and advice on those settling in Britain. After the concert, I spoke to its head, Andrei Tmarchenko, the director of the centre, about the experience of Ukrainian refugees in Britain and the future of Ukraine once the war is over. The centre is a joint initiative of the Ukrainian Catholic Eparchy of the Holy Family of London and the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain. And it was set up to respond to the needs of Ukrainian displaced persons who are coming to the United Kingdom under the uh, governmental schemes for Ukrainians designed to give them homes, to, to give them hope and uh, to, to, to give them shelter from the harm's way that's uh, uh, happening here, uh, happening back in Ukraine, uh, the terrible problems that are, they are, would be facing otherwise. Our aim is to help them settle because most of these people have had a lot of stress and uh, of course all of these people have a lot of worries every day even as they are staying here because for most of them they still have relatives in Ukraine or who may be fighting or just huddling away from, uh, from the war uh, where, where they are still. Most of the people who are coming here are mothers with children so of course they face lots of issues. Uh, they have to register for health care, they have to send their children to schools they, they eventually they want to find jobs to which they are entitled from day one and um, of course there's a lot for, for, for them to discover here and for many of these people this is a completely strange land sometimes they do not speak the language sometimes they they, they are just so disorientated that they need really help uh, signposting them to the right doors this is what our center aims to do but uh, on top of that we also want to not just help them physically settle and have their questions answered, but we also want to provide them a sense of community. After they have had all, the, all of their problems resolved, hopefully, the, uh, we invite them to come back, and many actually do, just to, to feel at home, to speak Ukrainian, to you know, be able to speak to their peers and uh, to exchange experiences and all of that. A sense of community, a sense of uh, keeping their relation to Ukraine uh, keeping this connection going instead of having to resettle and reintegrate, if you will, when they go back to Ukraine, when this is all over. What's their experience been like? How easy or challenging has integration been? I would say that um, it would be more correct to say that uh, they are not uh, immediately familiar with the culture because uh, talk to anyone in Ukraine and everyone has, uh, knows a lot about the UK. But it's, it's just that when, when it comes to actually settling here, whether for a short or long while, it, it takes a lot of getting used to it, a, a lot of adjustment really. So you have to know exactly how things work. We are both European nations, but there are of course subtle differences. And all these subtleties come to, uh, you know, represent a lot for these people, especially the, if they haven't been here before. It is our job to make sure that they feel more comfortable. It would be interesting to know how the centre came about. Was it set up quickly during the invasion or does it predate it? Let's just say that uh, we all knew what Russia was about uh, for centuries. Uh, however, even when 
after we saw all the preparations that uh, Russia did for the invasion, even then, uh, February 24th came as a surprise to, uh, and um, caught everyone off guard, really. Uh, however, in a matter of days, the um, uh, Ukrainian eparchy of uh, the Holy Family of London and the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain came together and they were expecting uh, an influx of people coming from, uh, from Ukraine. They decided that uh, it was time to prepare a response to that. So uh, I should say that uh, this center was conceived as an idea uh, at the beginning of March. It basically started operating in April in early April, initially as a website, and then uh, further on we started to develop. And then um, we are very grateful to this uh, eparchy, to this cathedral, that it provides us such an excellent premises to operate from. And um, if you saw what it was like, it was just empty walls. Now we have uh, grown quite a bit. We are absolutely thankful to all of the sponsors, all, all of the people who have been supporting us throughout all this time. This would have been absolutely impossible. And our center is very much about partnerships. We rely on people who provide good services, good offices, who, who, who provide all of this support day to day and also during uh, our events that we organize. How would you describe the morale amongst Ukrainians in Britain at the moment? As I said, many of them still have relatives in Ukraine. And uh, reading all the news, well, it's disheartening sometimes and it's very, very difficult sometimes to get through the day just uh, imagining what's happening. For all I can tell you, my mother is back in Kyiv. And um, when, when I read the news, it's very, very hard. At the same time, we stay united. And you should see the Ukrainian community when it comes together, when it comes, comes here to, to this cathedral. It's, we're talking thousands upon thousands of people. And um, they are very, very... Um, resolved. They want peace, but at the same time they know that in order to attain peace, the true peace, this war has to end in our enemy's defeat. What do you think the future of Ukraine looks like at the end of the war? Well, I think it will be a very peaceful country, as it has always been. But uh, there will be a lot of effort required to make all the restoration of what has been happening. And you can imagine that the destruction of infrastructure, of homes, of lives, of livelihoods uh, is just massive. It will require a lot, a lot, a lot of effort by the whole of the international community, not just by Ukrainians. Of course, Ukraine will not be the same for, for generations after this war. But once peace has been restored, uh, we hope that a lot of support will, will keep pouring into Ukraine, much in the way that uh, it kept pouring into the war-torn Europe after World War II from elsewhere in the world because otherwise it would have been impossible to restore even this country. Can you tell me a little bit more about the typical Ukrainian refugee, if that's a helpful way of thinking about it? It is very hard to, to draw a line of an average when it comes to living people because, I mean, there are tens of thousands of Ukrainians here now, but each of them is a separate story, a different story, and each has something unique to say. But I, I should say that on average, people who have come here from Ukraine uh, have had rather prosperous and hopeful lives before the war began, and especially this uh, February escalation that's still ongoing. Uh, they uh, normally w would, would be described as something like uh, middle class. They were normally uh, with very good jobs. They uh, w are a very well-educated workforce. The first thing they ask us when they come here, how do I look for a job? Ukrainians are very industrious people. It is very, very important for them to have their hands busy. They're excellent workers. That's why I think they are slightly different from the uh, usual concept of refugees uh, that uh, many people hold as a cliché in, in their minds. There's much talk about the remarkable leadership of Volodymyr Zelensky. What do Ukrainians think of him and what's your own personal perspective? I think he's doing a very good job and I, I hope that other Ukrainians are seeing him through the same eyes. It's, it's really hard to say. I mean, he's a wartime leader and look at, at the job that he's doing. Look at uh, how he is uh, being received all over the world. Look at what uh, everyone is uh, saying about him.
Thank you to all my guests today and to the Ukrainian Catholic Cathedral, the Ukrainian Welcome Centre and to the organisers of the concert, including the Ealing Symphony Orchestra and the London Chorus. You can find links to the work of all three in show notes for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave us a review as it really helps others find the show. Ukraine The Latest today was produced by Giles Gear and Madeline Drury. <laughs>